administrators who have all shown their love for the great sport of hockey. To the line, Chelios, a blast from the blue line, score! Chelios! I certainly enjoy the game, even if they have to go to the cold rinks like this, sometimes driving on bad roads at night, but it's part of the game. And you either love it or you don't love it. <laughs> Alfredsson, ja! Ja! Daniel Alfredsson avgör och ger Sverige möjlighet att bli världsmästare på hemmaplan. Lehtinen, Elion Keskela, Koivu, Lehtinen ja heti tulee maali! Ai, 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 ai! Jere Lehtinen dallas taas ja Suomi johtaa 2-0. On va faire à la fois du maniement de palais et des shoots sur les gardiens. Faire un slalom entre ces flots avec votre palais. To begin our ceremony this afternoon, would you please welcome the President of the International Oscar Federation, René Fizel. Just like that. Thank you, thank you, Gordon. Good day, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, 2018 IIHF uh, uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I, I would like to have a special welcome to, to my friend. IOC Life Honorary President Jacques Rogge. Thank you, Rogue, uh, Jacques, for, for coming here. It's, it's always a great pleasure to meet you. And also uh, the colleague from the IOC, IOC Executive Board Member, uh, Seam Yang Ng. I would like also to welcome uh, the inductees and the family, and uh, congratulations to, to, to you all. And I wish you here uh, a very great and magnificent day of hockey. Just enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. And so we'll begin. There's no such thing as a perfect hockey player. Or is there? When I called his former coach, Ken Hitchcock, to talk about our first inductee, he said that Yuri Lettinen was a perfect hockey player. He said that whenever Yuri was on the ice, things were under control. If a player was playing poorly, put him on Yuri's line, his game would come right back. He said the only problem the coaching staff had with Yuri was he knew more about the game than they did, so they couldn't really coach him. Yuri was a brilliant National Hockey League player, a Stanley Cup champion. He was also a brilliant international player for his country in five Olympics. And now he's our first inductee in the IHF Hall of Fame for 2018. From Espoo, Finland, Yuri Lettner. Though drafted into the NHL in 1992, Yuri Lettinen stayed home for three seasons and played pro hockey with Turku. He was a fixture on the Finnish national team, helping his country beat Russia to claim bronze at the 94 Olympics in Norway. A year later, he became part of history as Finland won the world championship for the very first time. 
By 95, he was ready to join Dallas and become a star in North America. Though he only scored six times in his rookie season, Lettinen quickly established himself as an elite two-way player. In 98, he scored against Canada in the bronze medal game at the Nagano Olympics and later won the Frank Selke Trophy as the NHL's top defensive forward, which he'd win twice more. A bigger prize came in 99, when the Stars won their first ever Stanley Cup. Lettinen assisted on Brett Hull's cup-winning goal. With that and a world title, he was the closest Finn ever to the triple gold club. But they suffered a heartbreaking loss to Sweden in the 06 Olympic final and settled for silver. With his bronze in 2010, he tied an elite group by earning four Olympic hockey medals and cemented his name among the best in the game. Yeri Lettinen. Please welcome to the player category for 2018, from Finland, Yeri Lettinen. Thanks, Gord. Uh, thank you, President René Fassel, IIH, to this great honor. Congratulations, all other inductees. I feel humbled to be included in this group here today. There is many people to thank today, coaches, trainers, teammates, a long way to this moment. I want to thank them all right now there. As a kid, your passion is to play the hockey, helping and caring your team and teammates. When you get older, you understand what needs to be done to be a better player. So I would like to thank Finnish Ice Hockey Federation for giving me opportunity to play for your country. Playing national teams helped me to be a better player. My first junior in international game was against Soviet Union. We lost 10-1. That was eye-opener for me, what was international level. Next year's tournament, we won them by one goal. That showed all us how much work, hard work you had to put in playing national team games. So these games got me a chance to be drafted, but still it was a long way to play in NHL. Next few years I was lucky to play world championship tournaments, won Olympics, before joining the Dallas Stars. Those tournaments got me ready to play straight to NHL. It's a special feel to re represent your country. There are so many great moments, so many great teammates. Playing Olympics, World Championships, World Cups, these moments live forever. And lastly, I want to thank my family, my parents, driving, feeding, <sighs> Supporting me and hosting like it. Uh, sorry, excuse. And my brother, you know, challenges me, challenging me every day to get better. My wife, Jana, and kids back home, Sofia, Anna, and Joel. Without your support, this couldn't have been possible. I love you guys. Thank you. Here. Always from the heart, always. The IHF Hall of Fame has players, it has coaches, it has referees, it has builders, and as of today, it has two families. For the better part of a half century, Philippe Le Carrier has been a cornerstone of French hockey, first as a player, then as an administrator, and last year as part of the organizing committee for the World Championship in Paris. And today, in a very special occasion, he joins his father, Jacques, in the IHF Hall of Fame. From Paris, France, Philippe Lacarrière. One Hall of Fame career per family is rare enough, let alone two. 
Jacques Le Carrière was already a French hockey legend by the time his son Philippe started playing. Philippe won the Spengler Cup twice with the club ACBB, and later, like his father, represented France several times internationally at both the Olympics and World Championships. He was the captain and top defenseman at his last Worlds in 1967, and got to play for his country the following year when it hosted the Olympic Games of Grenoble. Upon retirement, Le Carrière, again like his father, became a hockey executive. When the Olympics returned to France in 92, Philippe was named head of the hockey tournament. His expertise was respected by everyone in France, the IOC, and the IIHF. With contributions that continued last year as part of the Paris Organizing Committee for the World Championship. Never one to sit idle, he learned to fly in his 70s and enjoys getting back on the ice with his family, including his six-year-old grandson. A proud hockey tradition started by his father and carried on by Philippe La Carrière. Please welcome in the builder category from France, Philippe La Carrière. Today is the, probably the most difficult challenge in my life. It's to express, and not in my modern tongue, all the emotional feelings I have for this uh, induction. Sorry, I have to put some spectacles. I'm very impressed first to be inducted with a so famous player, the Daniel, Chris, Jasper, Jere, and Rob. Yere was happy to welcome last year in, uh, in Paris as a manager of the Finnish team. Obviously, Bob, who is uh, for me the Pope of officiating and, and rules. And he helped me so much when I was uh, chairman of the referee committee. And yours, obviously, Kierov, which is an eminent builder of the Latvian ice hockey. I'm very honored to be part of this uh, prestigious panel of the Hall of Fame family, about, uh, I don't know, 250 pers wonderful person. And I'm also very touched to join my father 20 years after he was inducted. I was lucky to know and appreciate nine presidents of the IHF, from Paul Loic to René Fazel, and uh, hope to perhaps have to the chance to see the 10th president later on. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pourquoi pas. <laughs> I had the chance to, to see the dramatic expansion of the IHF countries from a few to more than 75 now, and the fantastic development of ice hockey in the world. Of women, it's okay in the world. I could also le leave uh, extraordinary technological improvements, most with TV and computers. I remember when I was listening with very a lot of difficulties, NHL commentators on shortwave lamp radio, and now you can have the whole okay world I image life with smartphone. In life, we cannot be successful without work, passion and if you are alone. I had three passions in my life. My family, my engineer job in tunneling, which is not so glamour, and ice hockey, which is very glamour. And I was never alone. As far as hockey is concerned, thanks to my father who transmitted his passion for ice hockey. Thanks to my wife, Catherine, and my family who accepted sometimes with the, some difficulty 
this passion, and thanks to my grandson, Baptiste, who just started to be the fourth La Carrière generation as a hockey player. Thanks to all the people who helped me to live this passion. My teammates, coach, and opponents, like Shoshi Tomita, Edouard Pana, Dieter Kalt, late Neil Linson, Paul Ambrose, and so many others, French Federation President, Luc Tardif, board and staff, IHF President, this one, the only one, the only one. <laughs> Council members, most of them are here. Committee members, ISF general secretaries and staff, friends and international volunteers, and so many others. Still, I want to thank some person who made a wonderful job, who took care of us so kindly and efficiently to prepare our induction during and, um, and who represent all the people present behind the scene who helped me during all this year, and who work for the benefit of ice, okay? I mean, Victoria and the Hall of Fame team. And it's uh, my great pleasure to have all of you around me today to celebrate. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci, Philippe. In 1999, the Detroit Red Wings acquired 37-year-old defenseman Chris Chelios from the Chicago Blackhawks. Their hope was he could play one or two more years for them. He played 10. When he retired in 2010, Chris was the only player left in the NHL from the 1981 draft. There was also no one left from the 82, 83, 84, 85, or 86 drafts. He played more seasons in the NHL than anyone else. He played more games as a defenseman. He played in the Olympics in three decades, but it's not his longevity that made Chris Chelios the player he was. His coach in Detroit, Scotty Bowman, told me that every time Chris Chelios played, he gave you his best effort and said he was the most ferocious competitor he ever coached in the game of hockey. Chris Chelios was a legend for his NHL teams and for his country and is now a member of the IHF Hall of Fame. From Chicago, USA, Chris Chelios. The most enduring elite defenseman in hockey history. Chris Chelios began his NHL career with Montreal in the mid 80s, winning the Stanley Cup in only his second full season. He was also one of the leaders of Team USA, helping the Americans at big international events like the Canada Cup, making it to the final in 1991. He spent more than a third of his career in his hometown of Chicago and won the Norris Trophy three times as the league's top defenseman. He was U.S. captain several times, most notably when they upset Canada to win the first ever World Cup of Hockey in 1996 and led several Olympic teams, including 98 in Nagano, Japan. Shortly after, his NHL career took him to Detroit, where he'd win the Stanley Cup twice more. And he remained the leader of the Americans internationally to Olympic silver in 02 and won final Olympics at age 44 in 2006. His 26 NHL seasons is matched only by Gordy Howe. Truly a career for the ages. Chris Chelios. Please welcome to the player category from the United States, Chris Chelios. Thank you, Gord. Uh, thanks to the IHF, obviously. What a great honor um, this is to be inducted with these great players, teammates. Um, great friend, Rob Blake. We trained together. I always thought we had the same trainer um, back in the 90s, late 90s. And Blake, he's probably how many years younger? 10, maybe? And I said to my trainer, after one summer, he ended up winning the Norris Trophy that year, what advantage do I have now that we're doing the same thing? 
and he's 10 years younger. And Blakey went on to have an unreal career and win the cup. But uh, as you mentioned earlier, your, your teammates, coaches, uh, family, friends, all the support I've had over the years to allow me to play 27 years. Trace was there for every one of them, and then some with college. Where is Trace? I said, but thank you, Tracy, for putting up with all that. And can't do it without the wives. Everybody always says that, and your family and your kids. But I hope this is a reward to them for all the years. And um, we talk about coaches. Uh, I wouldn't like to say it was the evolution of USA Hockey, but obviously what happened in 1980. I never envisioned myself making it to the NHL, but my goal was going to college to make the Olympic team. And what the guys did in 1980, I don't think there was very many Americans in the NHL at that point. But realistically, I thought, you know, what a great honor that would be to represent your country and at least have that goal. And Lou Vero, the coaching staff, uh, Dave, uh, Pat, all the, the, the people I've seen for the last 30 years, Herb Brooks, Bob Johnson, made that possible. And what a dream come true to be one of the 22 or 23 players each year to represent your country. Um, I want to thank Nick for showing up. Lidstrom, one of the greatest players, the greatest defenseman I've ever played with. Um, uh, class act, uh, told him yesterday Sweden got lucky that game. Six nothing, <laughs> kind of lucky. Um, but uh, again, um, never once did I, I jump at the opportunity to represent my country, I think. Ironically, never played in a world championship. I wish you would move the, the scheduling to after the Stanley Cup playoffs <laughs> so some of us could make those world championships. I know Nick never, I don't know if Nick, if you ever had the opportunity to, to play in the world championships. I don't think he never missed the playoffs once in his career. But, uh, and watching again, uh, just seeing the players from each country, the fans, what it means to represent your, your country and, and what an honor it is. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a good friend of everybody in this room who we lost this March, Jim Johansson, uh, who I went to school with, won a championship with, and I wish he was here today to see this. Uh, no one was more proud to wear the jersey as he did for two Olympics, and then follow up, following his father's footsteps to represent his country as a, as a player, as management, and no one loved the game more than Jimmy or his country. So thank you, Jimmy. Um, I wish you were here. But thank you, everybody. Uh, Again, congrats to everybody, and thank you for this great honor. You see, Nick? You see, Nick, he's still ferocious, even in retirement. For the last 20 years, the IHF has presented the Paul Loic Award to individuals who make an exceptional contribution to the game of hockey. They've honored sponsors, they've honored officials, they've honored builders, players, and in 2013, they even honored a TV broadcaster. The award is named after the first president of the IHF who played a key role in building the international game. The award is named in honor of one of the most influential figures in the early days of international hockey. Born in Brussels in 1888, Paul Loic was a veteran of both world wars and was a key figure in the development of hockey in the early 20th century. A player on the Belgian national team, he took part in the first Olympic hockey competition in Antwerp in 1920. Loic then became a highly regarded referee, working international games for 17 years, officiating in four Olympics and six world championships. He also founded the International College of Referees. While still an official, Loic was elected the first IIHF president in 1927, a position he would hold for 20 years. Loic was a key player in expanding the World Championship, making it an annual event and turning it into a truly global competition. Also ensuring that hockey became a cornerstone sport at the Olympic Winter Games, a legacy that lives on today. Loic also saw the game spread widely, saw the United States join Canada as an early international powerhouse and worked to grow the game in Europe and around the world. Upon his retirement as IAHF president in 1947, Loic saw the World Championship expand to eight teams. In 1961, Loic was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame as a builder and was part of the IAHF's inaugural Hall of Fame class in 1997. In 1993, Latvia regained its independence and began its climb up the hockey ladder from Division C to the top level. The passion of its players exceeded only 
by the passion of its fans who've enjoyed 22 consecutive years at the top level of the World Championship. That long climb was made large part due to the work of our Paul Loic winner, Kirov's Leap Months. From Liepaja, Latvia, Kiros Lipmans. He's been Latvia's most important hockey figure since gaining independence in 1993. Lipmans was the only president of the Latvian Ice Hockey Federation until 2016, helping it climb from C to A pool by the 97 World Championship. With the help of NHL stars like Arter Zerbe and Sandis Ozilic, they upset Russia at the 2000 Worlds and started a run of four straight Olympic men's hockey appearances in 2002. Under Lipman's leadership, new facilities were getting built, including the one that hosted the 2006 World Championship in Riga. There were 16 more new arenas to come. Through his tenacity and vision, he established a diverse and successful program at all levels, including the development of women's hockey. He also worked hard to get Dinamo Riga back into the KHL. He became a prominent delegate within the IIHF, and in 2001, received the Order of the Three Stars, the highest honor a Latvian citizen can receive. He grew the game of hockey in his country exponentially. One of Latvia's true hockey heroes, Kiros Lipmans. Please welcome the 2018 winner of the Paul Loic Award from Latvia, Kiros Lipman. My dear hockey fr fr friends, time is running pretty fast. It seems to, the, to me that it, uh, it was yesterday when I was presenting our bid to organize, organize World Championship in small Latvia. But you supported us. It was a great moment in my life in hockey after us came other countries, and now we are in Denmark. Also not, not so, so big country, and I am happy, very happy. I would like to thank, thank, thank Big Hockey family for this moment of my life. I would like to thank all my friends if I start which names it will be till tomorrow. But hockey is a game, and I hope that you enjoy today's game more than speeches. Wish you all very good luck and enjoy the games. Thank you very much. You did great. Better than my Latvian. When I called him to talk about our next inductee, Joe Sackick didn't want to talk about hockey. He wanted to talk about surfing, of all things. Now, as it turns out, there's unwritten rules in surfing, one of which is that the more experienced and better surfers get the best wave. And if someone lower down the ladder goes to take one, they push them off their board into the ocean. And it was like that off the coast of Southern California for decades, until Rob Blake of the LA Kings took up surfing. And then that rule went out the window, because those who tried to push him off their, his board went from surfers to swimmers in seconds. <laughs> he was a towering presence on and off the ice. My colleague Ray Ferraro said he was the ultimate captain, someone who made everyone feel not just included, but important. A big shot, big hits, in big moments. He was a three-time Olympian, a Stanley Cup champion, a member of the Triple Gold Club, and now an IHF Hall of Famer. From Simcoe, Ontario, Canada, 
Rob Blake. He was a big, skilled defenseman who developed into an NHL All-Star with Los Angeles in the 1990s. But Rob Blake was also renowned for what he did on the international stage. An exclusive member of the Triple Gold Club as a World Olympic and Stanley Cup champion. The first great moment came in 1994 when he helped Canada win its first world championship in 33 years. They'd only have to wait three more years to do it again, beating Sweden for the 1997 gold. And Blake was named the tournament's best defenseman. A year later in Japan, he played in his first Olympics. And though Canada missed the podium, he would get another chance and was becoming the best defenseman in hockey, period. In early 2001, Blake was traded to Colorado. The Avalanche was on the verge of greatness. He helped them get over the top and got to lift the Stanley Cup for the first time. Then, Olympic redemption at the Salt Lake City Games of 2002. Blake and Team Canada struck gold, ending an even longer drought of 50 years. A brilliant 20-year career anchoring the blue line for his team and his country. Rob Blake. Please welcome to the player category from Canada, Rob Blake. President, uh, tremendous honor, the IIHF, thank you, Gord, thank you. Um, also to the other inductees, uh, tremendous weekend here. Uh, you know, Chris touched on our trainer, but uh, when Gord mentioned surfing, Chris was one of the first to introduce us to surfing, so I think he still has that honor there too. So uh, anyway, I, I can recall the first time I participated in the World Championships. It was after my second year in the NHL, and I got a call after uh, losing in the playoffs that night to to come over to a tournament that had um, was halfway completed and uh, play for Team Canada. So my recollection of uh, of Team Canada obviously was the Gretzky, the Muse, and the Canada Cup. So uh, very excited. I hopped on a plane the next day and and got to Finland and. Uh, we were playing Finland that night, so uh, you know I didn't really know what to expect. I went out for the warm up, and uh, a lot of you guys have been around uh, the World Champions, and it was a late game, so the fans are cheering and screaming all. And you know, obviously in Finland, uh, they had a lot of time to prepare for that game, so you know what they were doing during the day. But uh, I got in after warm up, and I didn't know my teammates very well, and, and you know it was a first international experience. I'm like. I really got to find a way to get in this game. So I'm like, okay, uh, maybe try to get a big hit or something, settle things down. So early in the period, I, I had a chance, so I took a pretty run at a, a pretty good run at a guy, and I, I heard the crowd start whistling, and I'm like, wow, they're cheering? Like, are they, uh, they they don't mind this when I hit their own player? So later in the period, I did it again, and I could hear the whistling again, and I'm like, that's pretty good. I got to the bench, and it wasn't until my uh, – partner leaned over and said, well, I didn't take long for him to hate you here. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, whistling is booing. So I learned the international experience pretty quick at a, at a stage there. But uh, no, I was fortunate to play in a, a number of uh, world championships and Olympics. And one of the greatest experiences was the, the first Olympics in, in Nagano, Japan in 98. And I think the decision that, uh, you know, Hockey Canada made to, to put the players in the Olympic Village was, uh, was one of the best things uh, or best ideas that could come about. Uh, you know, to, to experience uh, all the other athletes, uh, the, the tremendous training and work that goes in, uh, four-year preparation for some of those athletes for a 30-second run down a hill or a lap around the ice. And uh, for us to be able to experience was a tremendous uh, honor. So uh, to Hockey Canada, uh, especially, uh, you know, all the international tournaments, uh, the coaches, tremendous coaches and teammates, but uh, more importantly, the staff. Uh, I know Bob's here and, and Tom Rennie and, and over the years, uh, all that you did behind the scenes to allow our players uh, to experience these uh, these settings in different countries. Uh, again, thank you to Team Canada, and uh, also to my wife uh, Brandy, my kids. I got two of them here, Jack and Brooke, and my youngest is at home. Uh, you know, we've been able to experience these uh, th these opportunities, and, and again here, and we're going to experience Copenhagen. So, thank you for coming to that. But uh, just on behalf of my family and that, uh, thank you for this tremendous honor, and uh, congratulations. Okay, 
One of the cornerstones of international hockey is fair play. Respect for yourself, respect for your opponent, respect for your country. And players follow this code. But when they don't, officials are necessary. And one of the best officials on the ice and off for the last 40 years has been Bob Naden. Three decades as an on-ice referee, as a member of the Rules and Referees Committee, a previous winner of the Paul Loic Award, Bob Naden is now inducted into the IHF Hall of Fame as an official. From Toronto, Canada, Bob Naden. He excelled at a part of hockey that's rarely noticed when done well. That explains why Bob Naden may not be as famous as his fellow Hall of Famers. But he was a renowned referee who got more pleasure from officiating a game than playing one. He first put on stripes when he was only 17. His on-ice career hit its peak in the early 70s as he worked many big international events, including the 1972 Olympics in Sapporo, Japan. Naden later became a referee supervisor at a variety of levels, including the NHL, and he had a role in choosing the refs for the 98 Olympic Games in Nagano. Ultimately, his work led him to the IIHF, where he spent three decades on the Federation's Rules and Referee Committee, traveling the world supporting, analyzing, and assisting officiating crews at every level of the international game. That travel fueled another passion, stamp collecting, producing one of the greatest collections in the world. The IIHF has previously given him a ring for 45 years service and the Paul Loic Award for his contributions to hockey. But his ultimate stamp was on the next generation of on-ice officials. Bob Naden. Please welcome, inducted to the officiating category from Canada, Bob Naden. Right about now, I wish I had a whistle in my hand and not this microphone, to tell you the truth. Nancy, you come up here and comb my hair for me, eh? For over 80 years, hockey has been one of the most important facts in the family life of the Nadens, both my parents, my family, my kids. The Naden family started out before the Maple Leafs moved into Maple Leaf Gardens in the 1930s. Uh, the season tickets are still in my father's name, and I attend an awful lot of, of the uh, games as it is at present time. I got started refereeing and refereeing church league hockey, if you can believe that or not, when I was in roughly early, early teens. Uh, I carried on, and obviously the uh, most important part of my career was the referee, the uh, 1972 Olympics in Sapporo, Japan. <clears throat> and from then on, uh, I attended some form of, of an international meeting, whether referees, rules, over the years. Uh, in one of the early meetings um, I attended, this little short gentleman came up to me and said, I'm referee in chief. And I thought to myself, my mother looks more like a referee in chief than this guy. <laughs> and I said, uh, where did you say you're from? Oh, I'm from Switzerland. That same gentleman has probably fired me a hundred times. <laughs> now I'm done. <laughs> but I think more than anything else is the opportunity to meet people. And one person's name I want to mention to you, I see him here at this championship, and I've seen him every year. He's 96 years old and deserves a great deal of credit. Georgie Pastor, would you put up your hand so if people don't know you, who they are. I think that's the, to attribute to the sport and the type of people who, who become involved in the sport. 
Let's face it. Hockey has improved greatly over the years, and a lot of it is due, in my opinion, to the leadership in the national associations, plus the leadership in the IHF. Without the leadership in these national associations, um, the hockey would not be able to reach the level it has today. And these are people who spend a lot of time at the sport. They're not interested in their own image. For me, to be able to travel, uh, to be away from home weeks at a time, would be totally impossible for me to concentrate on my job. I knew that when I left, everything at home, the kids would be looked after, uh, the snow would be shoveled, the grass would be cut, and my wife would even go over to the school and pick up my paychecks. So I, everything, I owe everything really, or a good part of it, to my wife Nancy, who has put up with uh, me being away from home and spending hours working on documents and so on and so forth. So I don't like to be up here and mention a lot of people's names, uh, but there are a couple people. Uh, Philip Lacarriere, Lacarriere, who was chairman of the Referees Committee. Philip and I used to fight and argue over and over again about rules or about officiating. But I think the most important thing was that all of these times, it was the fact that we decided what's best for hockey. And I think that's important that the people involved respect the game of hockey. And I think that's why hockey has become one of the most important sports in the world. I did see a couple of incidents during the NHL playoffs um, where a reaction of one player against another player that to me showed no disrespect for the opponent or no disrespect for the game of hockey. And I don't want to see that happen in international hockey. Because I think that's it's significant that even though all of the people in, in the international hockey don't necessarily agree with each other, but as I said before, I think they have respect for the hockey. And to me, that's the most important thing, to have respect for the game. You're not always going to win your arguments and so on and so forth, but it's a game. And have respect for it. So. I'd like to thank the IHF for giving me the opportunity over all these years, over almost 46 years, to be involved both with the referee committee and the uh, officiating committee. And as I said before, without my support at home from Nancy, it would not have been possible for me to spend as much time as I do at the game. And once again, I must say it's been an honor and I've been proud to say I've been, been involved with hockey. I hope to continue on, and I know at home people say, why at your age are you still involved in hockey? You know, why are you out night after night going out supervising games? Uh, why are you driving the back roads in bad weather just to get to a game? I said, that's because of the love of hockey. So once again, congratulations to the award winners uh, this year, and in past years, so all the winners. Of the, of the awards of the IHF. So once again, thank you very much, and it's been my honor and my privilege to be involved with this board. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It can be difficult with powerhouse nations producing such great teams and such great players for smaller countries to make noise on the international stage. Well, except for today, with Switzerland playing in the gold medal game tonight. So to recognize the contributions of those from smaller nations, in 2015, the IHF inaugurated the B.B. Torriani Award, named after a Swiss legend who would be so proud of his country today. In 1911, Richard B.B. Torriani was one of the earliest European hockey stars. He played for the Swiss in the 1928 Olympic hockey competition in his hometown of Samaritz, winning a bronze medal. Torriani also took part in seven world championships for Switzerland in the 1930s, winning four medals. Along with Hans and Piccatini, Torriani played on the celebrated Nile line on the Swiss national team. 
one of the most famous and productive forward lines of the early era. In 1948, the Olympic Winter Games returned to his hometown of Samaritz, and Torriani was given the honor of taking the Olympic athletes oath, the first hockey player to do so at the Winter Olympics. Torriani went to his third Olympics as a player. In addition, the Swiss finished third in 1948, giving him bronze medals 20 years apart in the Olympics. Torriani was a member of the first IAHF Hall of Fame class in 1997. I don't know if you noticed in that footage, but uh, in some of those games, Torriani played against Chris Chelios, which is amazing that Chelios here today. <laughs> We've celebrated hockey in Denmark for the last couple of weeks as this nation hosts the World Championship for the first time. It has been remarkable both here in Copenhagen and in Herning, and you can see the passion that this country has for the sport. And you can see that this year, seven players from Denmark played in the National Hockey League. Five came back to play for their national team. And while they are great now, the foundation was laid long ago. And our winner today of the B.B. Torriani Award is the only Dane to have his number retired. Please welcome Jesper Denmark. From Holstbro, Denmark, Jesper Damgaard. He lifted a country never known as a world hockey power, proving a value that goes beyond simple gold, silver, or bronze. Jesper Damgaard was Denmark's leader from a very early age, a defenseman who played in 17 straight world championships. When he made his senior debut in 1994, the Danes were in B-pool and spent nearly a decade trying to make it into the top division. In 2003, they finally did, with their captain, Damgaard, leading the way with his skill and composure on the ice. His 11-year tenure wearing the captain's C was one of the longest tenures in IIHF history. He played more international games than any other Danish player and is the only one from his country to have his number retired. Number seven is now an inspiration that brought a world-class level of respectability to his team and his country. Jesper Damgaard. Please welcome the winner of the 2018 B.B. Torriani Award from Denmark, Jesper Damgaard. I'm very honored and proud to be standing here today. My first Nationals game was back in 92, where I played with the under-20 team in the sea pool. One of my first games, we played against the Slovakian team. We lost 20 to zero. And when I played my last one, my last tournament, we won six nothing. So a lot of things happened in Danish hockey during those 19 years. If anyone would have told me today that we're gonna host a the World Championship here in Denmark and Herning and Copenhagen, and playing the A-Pool, I would just be laughing at that at that time. One of the highlights of my career was in back in 2002 when we won the B-Pool. We were just a young team without any stars, missing our top players. But we came together as a group, and somehow we find a way to win the games. That was the starting point of a new era for Danish hockey. My last year as a player was in 2010 at the World Championship in Germany. It was a new milestone for Danish ice hockey. We went to the quarterfinals against Sweden. Unfortunately, we lost, but we beat teams as Finland, USA, and Slovakia during that tournament. As I said before, I played 17 World Championships for Denmark. I was the captain for 12 years. That's a big honor for me. 
I got some of my best friends back from that town, time. They're sitting here today, Kim Stoll and Morten Grein. The reason the team made this progress during that, that time was we're the same players always came together. We are like a big, big family. It was an honor for us to put on the Danish jersey. For example, I shared room with Kim Stoll for 14 years, so I know him as a pretty well. We started a culture and a mentality of what Danish hockey should be like. We are a small country, and I think we are where we are today because of the values and the culture which we laid the foundation to at that time. Today I work with the under-18 national team, and I try to carry on that to the young guys. Today I'm also a member of the Danish Ice Hockey Federation, so we continue to develop the, the hockey on all levels. I would like to thank my, say thanks to my family, my dad, Christian, my mom, Birgit, and my brothers, Chris and Klaus, who's here today, and of course my wife, Jenny, and my kids, Emma and Vigo. And thanks to my old uh, teammates and uh, to the Danish Ice Hockey Federation. And at least, and at last, but not least, a big thank to the IHF for recognizing my journey with the national team and to honor me here today. So thank you a lot. And now to our final inductee. Leadership comes in many forms. There are people who are vocal leaders whose words inspire their teammates. There are leaders by example who behave in a daily way that sets an example for their teammates and for others. And then there are both. I called Eric Carlson, Daniel Alfredson's fellow countryman and teammate, to get some advice on how to describe Daniel. And he said, every, sing every single thing he did, every single day, was an example of leadership. What he said, how he acted with teammates, with his coaches, with staff, with fans, with the media, was always an example. Daniel was a five-time Olympian for Sweden, a late round pick of the Ottawa Senators who became a foundation for that great team. And today, he becomes a member of the IHF Hall of Fame. From Gothenburg, Sweden, Daniel Alfredson. He was an outstanding young player with Frölunda in the early 90s, but few in the NHL could see what he would become. They saw it at the 95 World Championship when Alfredson helped Sweden beat Canada in the semifinals. By then, Ottawa had drafted him, but not until the sixth round. In his first NHL season, he scored 26 goals and won the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year. In 1999, Alfie became the Senator's captain and would become the greatest player in franchise history. And he was also among the greatest Swedes ever, playing in seven world championships, reaching the podium four times, including a silver medal in 2004. Alfredson also played in five Olympic games, averaging more than a point a game throughout, helping Sweden to silver in Sochi. But the crowning achievement had come in 2006, when Sweden won the gold medal. Alfredson led the way in scoring with five goals and five assists. A leader, a champion, a Hall of Famer. Daniel Alfredson. Please welcome to the Builder category from Sweden, Daniel Alfredson. down my jersey for the first time in my career today, but I'll, I'll pass. Uh, it's it's a, a great honor to be uh, here today, and obviously 
share this uh, with all the other inductees and uh, congratulations to you as well. What, what tremendous careers, especially I want to recognize Jesper. What, a, what an experience this must be to uh, uh, been through all this with Danish Hockey and to be able to be recognized in, uh, in Denmark as well. So congratulations. Uh, I was 14. I had to choose between soccer and hockey. And uh, I, I loved both, but I, the decision was fairly easy. I enjoyed hockey a little bit more. It was faster. You're always involved in the play when you're on the ice. And it was way more physical. Personally, I didn't play very physical myself, but I, I liked the idea of it. Uh, uh, being a smaller guy, you know, when you really did lay a hit, it felt really good. And uh, it wasn't too often, but once in a while. Uh, but that was drawing me to it. And I was a late bloomer as well. I'm born in December. It was a little bit later in puberty. It took me a little longer time. Uh, but I was very lucky to have really good youth coaches that still believed in me, that still gave me the chance to play power play, to play penalty killing, play all situations. So I was never left behind. They, they never told me, you know, well, you're not the best player. You have to play on the third or fourth line, just PK. And I think that had a really big effect on me becoming the player I did. So I want to take this opportunity to thank my youth coaches. Uh, start with my dad, who started coaching me. Uh, I had Beda, Paris and uh, Dick Carlson. They, uh, uh, you know, your coaching and guidance kept the love of the game for me go growing. So the first time I was introduced to a system in my career was when I was 19 and started playing in the Swedish Elite League. And uh, the coach uh, told me, and I've never played a system before, we're playing a 1-3-1. And I had no idea what that meant. I thought, when you didn't have the puck, all you do is you try to go get the puck and you work hard to do it, and that was the system. <laughs> and, and I realized that you can, you know, when you play together as a team and everybody knows what to do, it's really powerful as well. So I learned that my first few, few years uh, in Sweden, uh, although 1-3-1 one, one was not the favorite way uh, to play for me. Uh, I understood the, the effect it had on the team. Uh, and I also know the best players in the world, when I see these guys here, what's, what makes them stand out, I believe, is they know how to play in the system, but they also know when to step outside the system. Uh, that's what makes them ex exceptional. And uh, uh, that's another thing, I think, in my youth that I was taught, just how do you play on instinct? And then it's a lot easier to learn the system than it is to be taught a system and then learn to be creative. Uh, National team. I played the first time uh, I got a chance it was 93-94 during the NHL had a lockout for half the year. I was still in Sweden and I remember uh, I was surprised making the team and there was a lot of good players. I think Nick were on the team uh, playing a couple of exhibition games in, in Helsinki. Hawk and Lube, Kent Nilsson, uh, uh, Thomas Runquist, so many great players that I looked up to that I, that was my dream, play for the national team. The NHL was not even in my thought at the time. And uh, seeing the way they handle themselves on and off the ice, you know, coming a young kid, you're really nervous. What's, what's the experience going to be like? But the guidance they give, uh, the leadership they taught is something that, as my career went on, is something I want to try to bring back as well. The, uh, uh, the biggest effect on my career has been my parents, though. They're here today. I'm very proud. Mom and dad, without your support, uh, without your cooking, cleaning, making all the washes, uh, dad driving all the time, this wouldn't have been possible. So that, I want to take this opportunity to really acknowledge you today and thank you. Also to my wife, uh, uh, you've been uh, extremely supportive. Uh, hockey is a demanding sport, traveling a lot, but the way you've held the house together has been uh, uh, not, nothing short of spectacular, so thank you. Um, I think lastly, uh, Bob touched on it earlier a little bit, that uh, to be involved in the sport of hockey, I mean, uh, you could have been grown up to, to pick up any sport, but the people is what make this sport fantastic. 
uh, you know, we all met friends throughout uh, our careers at different, from different countries, from different places, and the friendship you create is, is, uh, is special. And uh, uh, the locker room banter or talk that goes on in the locker room in, in, in uh, Denmark or in, in Russia or in Sweden, it's all the same. And if you just show up and work hard, you're going to earn the respect of your teammates. So, uh, Rene, it's an incredible honor to, to be uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. This will show you how the game has changed. Our first ever induction speech done with the help of a tablet. And the amazing thing was he was playing video games while he was giving the speech, which is, which is even better. I noticed, Daniel, you're wearing the blue. Is that because of the Olympics? You wore the blue? You won, won gold in 06 and blue? Good for you. Well done. Uh, congratulations to uh, all of our honorees today. Uh, so deserving and well-spoken, and your love of the game and respect for it shines through. So congratulations to all of you. Yeah. As we wrap things up, we want to take a moment to remember uh, some of those who left us. Um, Hall of Famer Nils Nilsson from Sweden, who passed away this year, a brilliant Swedish international. Um, our friend Jim Johansson from USA Hockey, who was a great friend of the game and who worked tirelessly to promote it in the United States as a player, uh, as a builder. And to those who tragically lost their lives in the Humboldt bus crash in Canada in April. We remember you, we think of you, and we will carry your memories forever. Um, on behalf of all of us here today, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we honor the past of the game, we enjoy the present, and we look forward to a bright future of intense competition on the ice surface of international cooperation. Good luck to Canada and the United States in the bronze medal game today, and to Switzerland and Sweden in the gold medal game. And to all those here in Copenhagen and Herning, thank you so much for your hospitality. Pogen soon. Good day.